This week on Back in a Bit, we take a look at the winter night market. We have a look at Melbourne Hip Hop. And we recap the netball finals. Good morning. I've been Lauren Devine. I'm Cody Maxson alone. Welcome to Back in a Bit. So don't forget, you can catch up on anything you missed via our social media uh, or on YouTube uh, via the Upstart website. Mm. How's your weekend? Pretty good. I've heard you got up to a little bit of mischief on the weekend. Yeah. Um, I was celebrating my girlfriend's birthday. Happy birthday, Beck. Happy birthday. Um... So I went to a Spanish restaurant, um, and again, the other week we were talking about eating bugs, and I actually ate octopus. We're proud of you. I know. I'm proud of me too. I didn't like it. I didn't like the texture. It actually didn't taste bad. It's just like, I don't know. I don't like the idea of legs in my <laughs> mouth. Jess, have you had octopus before? I love octopus, and I, I think it's like so much better than calamari when you've got those tentacle suckers. Mwah, delicious. <laughs> Well, Jess, what's going on in the news this week? Some difficult stories this week. Um, in world news, victims of billionaire Jeffrey Epstein's alleged sex crime ring have spoken in court about their anger at being robbed of a fair trial after Epstein's suicide in prison on August 10. Virginia Guifrey was one woman who chose to speak out, also alleging that when she was 17, she was raped by British royal Prince Andrew, the third child of Queen Elizabeth, and eighth in line to the throne. Epstein had faced multiple sex offence charges over a period of 14 years. Prosecutors and police departments are now facing criticism for what some to believed, uh, believed to be leniency uh, based on Epstein's position of power and wealth in the community. Epstein also had connections with Bill Clinton, Kevin Spacey, Chris Tucker and Donald Trump. Flight records recently revealed that Trump had flown on Epstein's private jet, which was nicknamed the Lolita Express. And here in Australia, a family seeking asylum from Sri Lanka has been moved to Christmas Island after an injunction was granted stopping the Australian government from the deporting them until at least September 4. The lawyer for the family has been assured that they will not be separated but has had difficulty communicating with her clients since the transfer. The small rural town of Biloela in Queensland has rallied behind the family, organising peaceful protests across Australia. The news comes amidst reports that the Department of Home Affairs that is overseeing the process has the lowest rates of staff satisfaction in any public sector department, leading to Shadow Minister Christina Keneally suggesting the report is indicative of Peter Dutton's incompetence, saying any chairman or CEO in the private sector would hang their heads in shame with this kind of incompetent result. And the Civil Aviation Safety Authority is investigating after a video was posted on social media showing a man fishing while sitting on a homemade drone. With a VB in one hand and a fishing rod in the other, the man catches a fish while hovering over a reservoir in central Victoria. Experts, however, have warned against the practice, saying that without proper quality control, there are serious safety risks involved. Um, some difficult news there this week, Cody Lauren. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know about you guys, but definitely that story about the Sri Lankan family is very mm. upsetting. Um, what do you guys think? I think I find it a very difficult story. I, I do have children of my own, and when I see the faces of those children on the news, and, and they're quite young, the youngest um, daughter of the family is only two years old, and she's the reason why they've been granted an injunction for her case to be considered as to whether she can stay in Australia. So I find that really quite emotional, the fact that they were born here and that our government's not showing them any compassion. So they're currently staying on Christmas Island, from what I'm aware of, and they've opened up Christmas, Christmas Island, especially for this family. Um, that just kind of shows what kind of situation we're getting that what they're being put into. And this is a family that's been very active in their local community, a very small town of Biloela. The father was working in the meat processing plant there and the mother was very active in the local church and the community. And the residents of Biloela have come forward saying, we just want this family to come back home. Um, so it's really heartbreaking. Yeah, well, they were picked up in the middle of the night, weren't they? they Which were. was a bit of an outrage. There's some really distressing footage of um, the, the children online when they were... Um, taken and they were separated from their mother and the sort of youngest daughter screaming to, to be given back to their mother. So it's really difficult to see that this is being done by our government in the name of, of Australians. Yeah. And it's even worse to see because you see all this happening overseas a lot and it's just to be in our own backyard. It's That's just, right. just it's distressing. Yeah. And do you know wherever the decision goes, will the family stay together? 
Um, the, their lawyer has been assured that they will be staying together, um, but it's it's difficult to say what's going to happen. It comes down to the um, ministerial discretion of Peter Dutton, who doesn't have a strong history of showing discretion to anyone apart from sort of au pairs um, in this situation. He hasn't got a history of being compassionate towards asylum seekers and refugees. So, But we'll find out on Wednesday what happens to the family. Yeah, we'll keep a close eye on to this story. Yeah, we will. All right, so last Wednesday was the final night of the winter night market and field reporter Astral and the Back to the Back in a Bit team went to go check it out. Every Wednesday for 13 weeks, the winter night market at Melbourne's iconic Queen Victoria Market brings tasty food, warm fires, shopping and quirky entertainers to warm up your winter. Oh, every week. During the winter, whenever it's a summer one, we come here every week. We're on the peninsula. Two hour drive every week. Yeah, it's fantastic here. Oh, we love all the different variety of foods, the culture, it's fantastic. This year actually seems like a huge improvement to what we've seen previously, which is awesome. I mean, everything's moved around, but there seems more food options, there's more inside, but yeah, we don't really notice. It depends. It depends if it's a really cold night, it's nice to have like a warm drink, um, but otherwise, anything like meat on a skewer or melted cheese or something was <laughs> yum. I feel like, I don't know, there's no favourite, so. Take a stroll and enjoy the live entertainment and pretty party lights. Also, don't forget to take the 20 minute silent disco walking tour. There you go. Ay -ya. See, that's where you get. And the crowd clap, they're cheering, they go wild. Or, or more like wild in this case. Now, who can catch? Can you catch? Yeah, catch. We spoke to Tom Corbett, who sells flat glass bottle clocks and has been coming to the winter night market for the last two years. I drink every one of these bottles, yes, that's a big part of the job. I have to drink every single one of these bottles. It's amazing I make it down here. So I've been working in glass uh, about 20 years and um, yeah, this is one of the more commercial things I've done. I've been running this business for four years. So I find the bottles in, in people's bins or, and I go around to the specialty bars in the city. I am, I'm the, the bottle squasher. This being the last day of the night market, don't be disheartened. There's a hawker's market starting in a few days. Yeah, it's fantastic here. It's a great atmosphere every week. I think it's a lot more popular now and there's a lot more young people come. Yeah, there's a hawker's market that's on for about five weeks. And then there's another break and then there's a summer night market. So there's always something happening and they just have a few weeks off in between to reset everything up. To find more information, please visit the website qvm.com.au. This is Astral Andrades for Back in a Bit. How cool were those clocks? I know. I, I kind of want to get one of them. Can we get some for the studio? I, re I reckon we should. They looked super awesome. I reckon they'll look so cool. Let's do it. Definitely. <laughs> All right, well, now crossing over to something else in Melbourne, the hip-hop culture is starting to rise up through Melbourne. Our team had a look at what makes the Melbourne hip-hop culture so special. Uh, I'm not going to judge their music because, like, uh, to be honest, like, I'm not that stage. And uh, to be honest, a lot of people, the, before the underground, they were underground rappers. I really like their music, but after they go into commercial, I don't like their music anymore. But like, you know, we know all the people that are Australian artists who have broken through and created a career off this. So I, mean, I think it's great, bro. Like, you know, there's a lot of people getting a lot of attention on YouTube at the moment and stuff like that, hitting millions and millions of hits. And um, yeah, man, I think it's great, bro. And, and for it in five years time or three years time or even two years time, it's going to be crazy, bro. Like so many different styles and so many different people just creating and getting out there, bro. So, I mean, I think it's like, a, it's the burning pot of just opportunity, bro. And that's what I see, man. I see people can make jobs out of this, you know? So like, I think it's good, man.
to Australia, my brother Melbourne City, Victoria. Thanks bro, thousands of my way from my hometown, China. Here for my university in Bandura. My parents come here in 1987 to find a better living. Jobs in Dublin was depression. I'm just landing here, time just 11. And I just, my own language is called Zongwen. Food is different, language is different, culture is different. I got to protect myself with the defense. So on the ground rappers, the, a lot of them are struggling. A lot of them are struggling, I mean. It's like, you're, yeah, you're currently in Melbourne, in Australia, you know, those people, they, they work hard. A lot of people, they got talent, but they don't just don't, they just don't get this, this opportunity. Cause like, you know, all in Western co countries, like the US, Canada, it's like people, you know, this culture in those countries, they easily get a chance to get opportunity to, you know, make them wealthy, at least, you know, can make them as a career. But Australia is quite difficult because it's not a kind of like to, you know, to, to like everyone, like public accept these things. So, you know, everyone, a lot of people see this as a hobby, but, you know, they do, they're trying to do that as a professional, as, as their own career or business, you know, on business. But kind of the situation in Australia currently is kind of difficult, it's tough, but I think all the people, they're working on that. It's getting better, it's getting better for sure, but it takes time, it takes time to, you know, to reach that level. Awesome. Well, joining us in the studio now is Yankee Lee. Yankee, how are you? Yeah, good. How are you? So, can I ask you, Yankee's a nickname, yeah? Yeah. How'd you get so, that nickname? Uh, so, actually, like, when I was little, I was just, like, very into the Western culture, especially, like, American culture. So, and also, I'm a big fan of the New York Yankees. So, that's why so my fans started calling me Yankee. So, I just used this as a nickname. So after that, I just used it as my English name. So, like, uh, like uh, all the kind of situation, like, uh, as my rap name, even, like, you know, so yeah, just I just use the name this name as my name all the time now. Yeah. How did you get into hip hop? Uh I there was like uh it's gonna be a long story. So I'm just kind <laughs> of like, you know, I like when I was a little I love basketball. So I see a lot of basketball players. I think uh the person who really impacted me called Island Iverson. So he's the first guy. He really like kinda like break the road, you know, it's like yeah. it bring the hip hop to the NBA. Then it's like at the time I don't know what is hip hop, so I just like yo, this dude looks like very, you know, it's like different. So yeah, then after that I just like start listening some like a hip hop music. Then I get into know it's like oh that's the hip hop. Then I just start doing hip hop myself like when we're in middle school. Excellent. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so what are your sort of musical influences in terms of um, mm -hmm. your current creative process? Oh, there's quite a lot, like, but I'm still, like, uh, into, like, uh, old-school hip-hop music. So uh, I think the time very influenced me, the time, like, back to, like, uh, 2000, like, Eminem, like, Jay-Z, 50 Cent, and all, like, other old-school people, like, you know, like, uh, like, Westside, West Side, like, got a Tupac, uh, Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, and the East Side got a Puff Dez, like, and, like, a Notorious B.I.G., yeah. Awesome. Oh, awesome. Um, What's the hip hop scene like in Melbourne? In Melbourne, I think uh, Melbourne is quite a. I I to be honest, it's gonna take like a long st long time to discuss about this topic. I just make try to make it shorter. You know, it's like a Melbourne. It's like a, I would like to say Melbourne got a lot of like very great artists, and they super super good. But but Melbourne is kind of you know this culture still like more like a on the ground. It's not a very going to like commercial. You know, but like sort of things but you know they, those years like it's getting better and better but and i i know a group of people is like the you know they're really doing something very great then but i think there's like a um like a still distance between like uh, australia and and the u.s because u.s this culture is original from the u.s and it's been develop, developed like more than 40 years australia is like a lot of people like love this culture but it's like it, they don't see it as like a, a industry exactly industry but there's like a big tension on that, awesome. that that's what i think yeah. yeah and before you're telling us that you can rap in different languages yeah yeah so yeah i rap in chinese and english as well yeah yeah awesome and so do you prefer freestyle or more pre-written rapping uh it depends because like <laughs> uh in the beginning it's like uh, i I like I I've been to a lot of like rap battle competitions the the time back to China because like I do freestyle like mostly I do in Chinese, yeah. So but mm -hmm. it's like uh so after that I also started producing the songs like back to China I've made like more than like 
like 10 songs like a big uh, uh, before I come here. Then also like during my life uh, uh, in the university, I also made a couple of songs and it's just kind of like dedicated my life here. So yeah, it's kind of just my real life. So the songs I've, I've been made recently. And recently I just dropped a new song so like two, two weeks ago, it's called China to Australia. Yeah. Ah, awesome, yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, can we get a little bit of a taste? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you sure. mind putting on the headphones over there, giving uh, us, yeah. we'll drop a beat for you? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Let's go. <laughs> Let's do it. So what do we got to do now? Do we got the beat going? Yeah, so, all right, so. I'll do When I grab my, I'm just f***ing tall Oh, sorry, I swear the word, but that's okay Apologize, let's keep it going on uh, Everybody cheer, we're gonna have fun Alright, now I'm gonna speak to my own language Child Chinese, it's called Zongwen So you can now we do it So you can see my face, let you relax We're now in the same way Let's go, let's go Oh, I need my own style Use my own style to give you a speech Yeah, this is my style Yeah, freestyle, we're going to keep going Yeah, China to Australia We got a love, we got a hair power China to Australia Different culture, but the same love I'm coming from La Trobe, seven campuses Different regions uh, excellent teachings, we got your attentions Yo, you really gotta know, you really gotta show That's me, Yang Kili, you gotta remember my name Yeah, peace Awesome! <laughs> Thank you so much for yeah. joining us, Yankee Thank Thanks, you so much Lee. Awesome, thanks for joining Anyway, <laughs> moving on um, This week on The Boardroom, I discussed memes And the nostalgia associated with memes of pop culture mm -hmm. So, what's the question again? Oh, no. Memes oh, okay. have had a strange evolution. Originally photos of characters that represented certain ideals, they have now encompassed in the form of internet humour. This ranges from copy pastas to surreal humour to screen captures. The best example of these screen captures are prequel memes, memes based solely around the prequel Star Wars trilogy. There is also Raimi memes, memes based solely around the original Spider-Man trilogy or any films by Sam Raimi. Through these memes is a community that has united in their love of the movies. But is it the movies they love or just the memes? I'm Cody Massalo and this is The Boardroom. Far back as 2005, when Darth Vader's no! was posted to YouTube. At the time of release, many of the lines were not popular, but now, hello there, this is pod racing, and I am the Senate are so well known across the internet. Something remarkable started happening on these meme pages. People started gaining an appreciation for the film, saying that they were misunderstood. Raimi memes shares a very similar rise as prequel memes. Memes from Spider-Man 3 were posted relentlessly on YouTube as it was the rise of the YouTube platform. But similarly to the prequel memes, a newfound appreciation for the films came about. There's even a fan written script of Spider-Man 4 based off reports of what director Sam Raimi planned to do with the franchise. Yet, while I do love prequel and Raimi memes alike, I feel the need to talk about why these films were chose to be memed. Honestly, they're tacky and at times a slog to get through. Subsections of these meme groups are staunch defenders of the films though. Most are just joking and not serious, but some are completely serious. With Disney's push of Star Wars films and TV shows and games since 2015, the sequel trilogy has come under criticism from these devout prequel fans. Yet, it's funny to say that the sequel memes have problems and not point out the obvious flaws in the prequels. Both Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones are considered average at best. But there are plenty of things to point out in the films that were wrong. First off, the unrealistic over-the-top battle sequences that went completely against the simplistic battles of the original trilogy. And then the ridiculous overuse of CGI. The original trilogy used practical effects that took time and effort to make. The prequels had so much CGI that it felt unreal and oftentimes hard to be immersed. And then there are these characters. George, why did you think Jar Jar was a good idea? The original Spider-Man trilogy is almost the exact polar opposite of the prequel trilogy. The first two films are considered classic superhero films, the third film not so much. 
Yet these films have become beloved by the fan bases and I think it is because of nostalgia. Fans don't remember the feeling of being disappointed because they have processed it and can now actually look back fondly. While I have been critical of the films, my opinion is that you shouldn't stop enjoying the films if you do. George Lucas and Sam Raimi created film franchises that many directors, writers, and producers still try to copy today. Art is subjective, and you can like whatever you want as long as you respect the people involved. On that note, that's it for the boardroom. If you want to see a longer version of it, you can go to Upstart's YouTube channel. I will see you guys next time. Happy memeing. Well, I'm loving this week's shirt. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, I actually got it as a gift from my mate uh, for my birthday last year or two years ago, somewhere in there. I'd like to see the shirts coming. Content each week, new shirt. I would have to buy a lot of shirts. <laughs> That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Let's jump in straight with sport with Lexi. What do you got for us yeah, this week? Yeah, so the Suncorp Super Netball semifinals were on this weekend, but the main talking points came before the matches had even started. Here's my story on what went down. In the lead up to the Super Netball semi finals, Vixens fans copped a blow when Netball Australia lost its bookings to all three viable stadiums at the Melbourne and Olympic Parks precinct to an esports festival. It means that the Vixens were unable to host their semi finals clash with their crosstown rivals, the Magpies, at their home stadium. Netball Australia lost access to the venues last October when the Melbourne Esports Open confirmed they were going to use all three stadiums being Rod Laver Arena, Margaret Court Arena and Melbourne Arena. Super Netball Chief Executive Chris Simmington said the league would not be able to put down enough money to secure a speculative booking and ensuring that they don't lose out on a stadium in the future wasn't something they could guarantee. While Netball Victoria Chief Executive Rosie King said that Netball Australia would be absolutely kicking themselves and this was probably a worst case scenario. So what's the solution? The 3,000 seat State Netball and Hockey Centre. The downgrade from Melbourne Arena's 9,500 seat stadium did not sit well with Netball fans. Yeah, I was just outraged. It's such a step backwards for a sport that's been taking so many steps forward. I mean, these women are professional athletes and they're hosting a final at a venue that just primary and high school kids play at. Like, they deserve a big stage and it's disappointing they're not going to get it. The outrage spread across social media with further anger over ticketing prices and minimal parking. This led to the Vixens advising public transport, but to make matters worse, PTV planned to replace all trains on the upfield line with buses. Not to mention, the players themselves seemed a little frustrated. The reality for netball fans is that the majority couldn't watch the historic clash live. I was at the um, game last time Vixens hosted the Magpies at Melbourne Arena and it was a sellout crowd. There was over 9,500 people there. And State Netball Hockey Centre can hold like 3,000. That's barely a third of loyal fans like me that don't ever miss games that just can't go. So if there's no guarantee this won't happen again, what's the solution? A new stadium would be great, but I think we just need those bookings to stand. We need the respect from the Melbourne Olympic Park that, you know, they, they are our only venues. Awesome. Brody's joining us in the studio as well now for sports. And Alexi, it was a bit of a debacle with the stadium switch, but it may have actually benefited the Vixens? Yeah, it seemed to look like that, actually. The Vixens uh, just defeated the Magpies by 13 goals. It was a massive turnaround from their loss last week. Um, it all came off the back of a 20 to 9 first quarter. And uh, a little bit uh, of something that could be influencing that was the fact that the Vixens do pl uh, train at the State Netball Hockey Centre week in, week out. So it could have actually played into their hands. A little bit of an advantage there, I see. Yeah, yeah it seemed like it. And uh, shout out to Nat Medhurst. She's a Latrobe student, but also a Magpies goal attack. And she played the game with cracked ribs. So. Pretty that, solid that, effort. That would hurt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Lexi, the Sunshine Coast uh, into their third straight grand final looking for the three-peat. Yeah, absolutely. They are looking to be already the most successful team in a three-year competition. Um, uh, they overcame the New South Wales Swifts by 10 goals. And a lot that you can put that down to is their coach, Nolan Tarua. She has got the game on a string. Like She knows the ins and outs of it. She... Uh, is also the Silver Ferns captain, so the New Zealand team, uh, and she literally brought them back from the dead to bring to uh, deliver them a World Cup gold medal just a couple months ago. So, so yeah, she is a big, big influence in that side, and uh, yeah, looking for the three peat. It will be exciting. <laughs> be exciting when they get it. 
Yeah, they're exactly. Gonna probably yeah. Win. yeah. So we've still got to see uh, who can win out of the Swifts and Vixens to, in the prelim. And yeah, the winner of that will go into the grand final. So I can't wait to watch it. Mm, should be fun. Yeah, a- AFL. Looking What's going AFL on this week? Uh, so we've got the first week of the finals coming up. Uh, Geelong will be playing Collingwood and MCG. So there's another stadium debacle where uh, Geelong will have to, you know, lose their home field and play at the MCG but just that, to accommodate numbers. Yeah, but that's been a thing for so long. It has. It's, it's almost normal. You know, they yeah. expect it, but <laughs> still. Uh, we've also got Essendon taking on West Coast in Perth. Brisbane taking on Richmond in Brisbane, and the Giants and the Bulldogs will be playing as well. Um, Cody, what are your picks for the weekend? Uh, I think Geelong. I think they're too good. I think Collingwood's, you know, unfortunately got too many injuries. Uh, I think West Coast in in Perth. Honestly, <laughs> I know you're an Essendon fan. I know that upsets you. It does. Um, Brisbane and the Gabbo feel like they're gonna come back a bit mm-hmm. from uh, two weeks ago or last week, I guess. Um, and probably the Bulldogs over Giants, I reckon. What about you guys? What do you think? I'm just going to do the opposite because you diss Essendon. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> I'm just going for Essendon because it'd be rude not to as a, Thank you. As a you know, Essendon supporter. But uh, I would say uh, the Giants pick Bull- Bulldogs match, I'd be tipping the Dogs there. After you know, They won by about 61 points in their round 22 match. So, yeah, I think they'll have that one. Um, and I'm just going to go Collingwood. Um, I reckon they can overcome uh, Geelong. And then to finish off, I'd say Brisbane at the Gabba will we'll take it out. Yeah, I think the difference between the MCG and the Gabba is, you know, different stadiums sort of. I think Brisbane are going to be a lot more on form and on top of it and try to make the adjustments that they need to. Yeah, and then uh, suddenly, once Brisbane start playing well, almost every Queenslander is an AFL fan. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's almost the same. Like you know, in Melbourne with rugby, I feel we're like don't care about rugby. But then as soon as <laughs> as soon as like Storm does well, oh yeah, yeah. we're <laughs> Um, Lexi, the Open, the US Open. What's yeah, so uh, in the tennis, Nick Kyrgios bowed out. Uh, he lost to Andre Rublev in straight sets. Um, so did Alex Dimonor. He did uh, defeat Kei Nishikori, the world number six, but then lost to Grigor Dimitrov in straight sets. Uh, then in the women's draw, Ash Barty, she lost her round of 16 match, 6-2, 6-4 to China's Wang Xiong. And, uh, but that she there is still light at the end of the tennis end of the tunnel um, because she is into the third round with her doubles partner, Victoria Azarenka. And uh, as we all know, she's very successful in the doubles, having won the US Open last year. Mm. Absolutely. We wish her luck in that one. Yeah, Hopefully def- we get a win. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately it seems like our single stars haven't, you know, done too much in this tournament, unfortunately, but hopefully get something out of the doubles, right? Yeah, hopefully we can get a good news story out of this <laughs> US Open. Not just Australian tennis. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Um, so we're going to swing yeah, over to the airport as I am a swing man in basketball. Yeah, yeah. What about a swoosh man? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, I need a new co-host. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, so Australia beat Canada in their first FIBA World Cup game, which is huge. Uh, Del Vidova had 24 points. Joe Ingles had 13 points and 9 assists, which I'm pretty sure is the highest assist number for any Australian in the FIBA World Cup, um, which is huge. Um, and they're in a very tight group, so every win is very important. It's good to see them win, yeah. And the tournament is kind of set up a bit like the FIFA World Cup, right? Yeah, that's right. So they start off in like a round robin, and then the top two teams from each group moves on to the next round. Um, so, yeah, and like I said, such a tight group. Every game is massive for Australia. And I've also heard that there's a bit of a <coughs> weird trade in the NFL. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, uh, a very weird trade. Jadeveon Clowney, who's one of the best defensive players in the league, was traded to the Seahawks from the Houston Texans for almost nothing. Um, it was a very complicated debacle and we don't really have time to go into it but yeah uh, it was a very odd trade and the Texans have kind of jeopardized the future a bit by giving up two first round picks when they could have you know done it a lot better way um maybe the result of not having a general manager but who knows yeah yeah well thank you the two of you for joining us thanks for having us really interesting stories in the sporting world so thank you so much thank you thank you well that's it for this week. Did you have a good time? I had a great time. I know. A lot of interesting stories. Got Yankee in as a do some freestyle rapping. I think it was pretty awesome. I reckon he's pretty good. Maybe we could get him as like a title sequence for our show or something. Ooh, that'd be interesting. Let's as. keep working with Yankee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if you guys want to follow us on social media, you can via Upstart Magazine on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, as well as catch up on at the show at the YouTube channel Upstart Magazine. We've got a big show in next week. I'm yeah, pretty sure. <laughs> I think I think so. I'm pretty sure. I think there might 
potentially be bugs. Oh, cool. is next week bug week? Maybe. I'm not too sure. We'll have to see. I'm getting excited. <laughs> <laughs> You're not. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm a fussy eater. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us. I've been Lauren Devine. And I'm Cody Mepson-Lowe. And we'll be back in a bit. <laughs>